Fish. Hey, Big. Dude, it's two in the afternoon. You've got to be waking me up for a good reason. This is a good reason. You're not going to believe this. <sighs> what? Dude, we got a donation. Say that again? Somebody donated to the show. Oh, finally, man. Finally, you don't know how much crap I've been putting up with. I'm done, man. I am done with this stupid microphone that always shorts out. You know what? F*** you, man. And f*** r o eight o t. I'm, I'm, I'm f- announcer, man. F- the listeners. F- Alex Dare Stewart. F- Luke Cuttington. And I, I am taking my half of the money, and I am. I'm going to go to Mexico. I'm going to spend the rest of my life on the beach. And you know what? I just hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. Hey, goodbye. Hey, Rish. Yeah. Rish. What? The donation was only five bucks, man. Oh. The Cuttington. Um, okay. Ah, uh, that's, that's, that's good news. <clears throat> good yeah, to hear. Oh, pretty cool. Yeah, so how, how are things going with you? You going to make it out to record tonight? Yeah. Why, why wouldn't I? <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Good evening. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 3, page 14. Only 14? I am half of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And the other half here, Big Anklevich. Today's story, Good Day, by Saul Lemerand. Saul Lemerand is 27 years old. He's a full-time flooring installer and a full-time student at the University of Green Bay. His publishing credits include Necrotic Tissue, (laughs) Down in the Cellar, and Drabblecast. In his free time, he likes to... Well, he doesn't have any free time, but if he did, he'd like to think he would do something exciting. His current favorite writers include Brett Easton Ellis, Chuck Palahniuk, Neil Gaiman, and Philip K. Dick. He often daydreams about questing with a crew of space cowboys who fly around on a Firefly-class spaceship. We also have a special guest reader. Bennett Jackson responded to our call a few weeks ago for voice actors that are interested in helping us out on the podcast. Bennett says he has no website to pimp. He's just a college student who listens to too many podcasts and enjoys confusing people with his funny voices and expansive vocabulary. Thank you, Bennett. Warning, today's Dune Steve story is extremely sick. Sick. Good Day by Saul Lemeron. Tim was smiling. He had a feeling it was going to be a good day. Although feelings like this tend to be good for everyone, they were better for Tim because of their relative lack of frequency. To say that he'd been depressed would be an understatement. It had all started when his wife asked him for a divorce. This alone, being enough to depress a person, was compounded by recent and frequent episodes of misbehavior by his two sons and his mother's relentless meddling. The last few days had been looking up for Tim, though. He'd made a decision to let go of his problems and not worry about things he could not control. Maybe they'll just work themselves out, he hoped. Even though it seemed unlikely, the comfort was enough to relieve much of his stress. Without these worries, the last few days had been wonderful for Tim. Looking at himself in his bathroom mirror, he wondered, Could I be too happy? He'd heard stories about mentally defective maniacs who could waltz through their lives without the slightest notion everything around them was completely topsy-turvy. Am I being naive? He wondered. Is it obtuse for me to believe that my problems can just solve themselves? He let this notion pass quickly as he realized he'd begun to worry he was not worried enough. Tim sat down with his two sons at the breakfast table and opened the morning paper. He'd always found the morning paper comforting. Not that he reveled in the sort of things society found problematic. It was more that he was comforted with the fact society continued to find the same things problematic on a regular basis. 
This morning's paper, which was the Friday morning edition, contained the same sorts of stories it always did. Local politics, crime rates, war in the Middle East, gas prices, new business openings, factory closings, suicide lists. Nothing new, just the same sort of comfortable sameness Tim had come to depend on. Reviewing the suicide lists, Tim found himself slightly troubled. They were longer than they had been on previous Fridays, covering almost two full pages now. For the longest time, the local paper had just listed the suicides in its obituaries section. Every once in a while giving article space to suicides it knew its subscribers would want to read about in more detail. After a while, the papers noticed suicides were taking up far too much space, so they started to compile the names and print out the week's full list in their special Friday Suicide Edition. Wondering if it was something he should be worried about, Tim looked up from his morning coffee and asked his sons what they thought about suicide. They stared at him blankly. His elder son, Charlie, asked, What do you mean? Tim stiffened up, perplexed. What do I mean? He wondered, looking down at the morning's paper. Well, he said aloud. Like, I guess, like, how would you feel if someone you knew decided to run a garden hose from the tailpipe of their car to the inside of their car? Why would someone do that? Charlie interrupted. Again, Tim found himself perplexed. His children always had a way of confounding him. For the purpose of a painless suicide, I guess, he said slowly. Garden hose is too small, said Franklin, his younger son. It's not well suited for the task. I'd say a central vacuum hose would work much better. Tim wondered where his kids acquired such strange ideas. We don't even have a central vac, he said aloud. Franklin shrugged and said nothing, shifting his focus back to his Captain Crunch. No, thought Tim, looking down again to read his paper. Nothing to worry about at all. He looked over to Franklin. Do you need a ride to school today? No, said Franklin. I think I'd like to walk today. Tim knew enough not to ask his elder son. At 17, Charlie liked to put as much distance between his father and himself as possible. He already had a hard enough time dealing with the fact that his father taught at the same high school he went to. As Tim was driving to work, someone jumped off the overpass and crashed into the pavement of the left lane, forcing the van next to him to slam on its brakes. Tim praised his good fortune, as he was in the right lane and therefore was able to drive past the corpse without stopping. His satisfaction was reinforced when the morning's radio traffic report informed him they'd had to close the highway because of the incident. It seemed like too good a day for him to be late for work. As he drove, Tim listened to his favorite radio morning show, Talk of the Morning. They were interviewing a doctor of human biology. The doctor was explaining the varied roles bacteria play in the common everyday world. When you die, the doctor explained, your immune system dies with you. Bacteria that's normally harmless to the human body finds itself no longer hindered by white blood cells or high body temperatures. Our cold body is a breeding ground for bacteria. They, they feast on our flesh and they expel gas as a byproduct. We call this the process of bodily decay, or as it's more commonly referred to, rotting. On a hot day in a stuffy garage, the corpse of a recently deceased suicidal man or woman could begin to stink before their kids got home from soccer practice. It, it's, it's all just part of our extraordinary cycle of life. Once in class, Tim was pleased to learn an unprecedented number of his students had actually done the assigned reading. He knew it was an extremely rare occurrence for high school students to take an interest in classic literature, and decided this was indeed a good day in the making. Seeing them so obviously interested, Tim jumped at the opportunity to reach out to his students. Passion, he said, slamming his fist on his desk to begin class, is the single motivating factor in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Their unrelenting need to be together ultimately resulting in their tragic demise. Noticing some of his students murmuring in the corner, Tim looked in their direction. One of them, a girl who, up until now, had never spoken a word in his class, raised her hand and asked, Do you think that outside of passion, Romeo and Juliet could have been expressing resentment? This interested Tim. What do you mean? He returned. Well, she explained, as a teenager, I can certainly relate to the concept of controlling parents. When parents refuse to allow their children to make their own decisions, it creates a lot of resentment. 
I know I'm not the only kid who's considered hanging themselves from the ceiling fan in the living room, timing it just right so that when my parents come home from work, I can see the looks on their faces as my neck is snapping. As a collective murmur of agreement swept the class, Tim felt a strong sense of pride, knowing his students were actually relating classic literature to their own lives. He wondered what had happened to make them suddenly so interested in Shakespeare. On Tim's lunch break, he discovered a body hanging in the teacher's lounge. Remembering his classroom discussion, he wondered briefly if this person had chosen this spot on purpose. The body was hanging right in front of the microwave, which was horribly inconvenient. Any faculty member, including Tim, who wanted to heat up their lunch, now had to swing the corpse to one side, while at the same time opening and closing the microwave door, and then set the cook time before letting the body back down. After warming up his own lunch, Tim sat down at the table with his co-workers, Ms. Johnson and Ms. Darkenthorpe. He then pointed at the hanging corpse. It's the funniest thing. I was just talking about this with my class. He chuckled. Classic teenage rebellion, said Ms. Johnson, the school's psychology teacher. But why'd he have to pick such an inconvenient spot? Asked Ms. Darkenthorpe. Hey, it could have been worse, said Ms. Johnson. This morning, somebody jumped off an overpass in front of my van. I was stuck in traffic for an hour. That was you? Tim asked, somewhat bemused. <laughs> Small world. When Tim returned to his classroom, he noticed half of his students were missing. They all had something important to take care of at home. Or so the notes they left him had said. Tim found himself grateful because it's so much easier to reach students with a smaller class size. <laughs> After work, Tim drove to his therapist's office. Tim had been seeing him every Friday since his wife had asked him for a divorce. He'd been depressed, very depressed, but in light of his recent positive outlook and overall happiness, he was pretty sure this would be his last time seeing Dr. Romero. Tim felt his left foot slip out from under him as he walked into the front door of his therapist's office. He landed shoulder first on the marble floor with a thud. The doctor's secretary rushed to help him up. Oh, uh, I'm so terribly sorry, the secretary said as he held out his hand to help Tim up. Tim stood up and noticed he'd slipped on a pool of blood. Tracing the pool to its source, he discovered an old woman with a sword pushed clear through her torso. He took a moment to collect his thoughts, told himself to let go of his apprehensions, and then smiled to himself. He turned a questioning gaze to the secretary. It's called Sepuku, said the secretary, enunciating Sepuku in three rapid-fire syllables. Also known as Harikari. It's a form of Japanese ritualistic suicide. The old lady sure did love her samurai movies. You should clean that up, said Tim, slightly disturbed by the office's lack of professionalism. Don't worry, someone's on it. She only just bled out, you know. I'm surprised you couldn't hear her screams from the parking lot. The secretary adjusted his tie and led Tim into the psychologist's inner office. Once inside... Dr. Romero motioned for Tim to sit down. How are we today? asked Dr. Romero. Pretty good, said Tim. I think this actually might be our last session. Dr. Romero looked surprised. You're no longer depressed? he asked. No, not at all, said Tim. I really believe I've finally come to peace with my relationships and surroundings. That is certainly good to hear said the doctor, taking a moment to review some notes he'd made during Tim's last visit. So your panic attacks are... They're gone, responded Tim. No anxiety problems? None. The doctor sat back in his chair, reading from his notes. Over the past few months, you've been expressing your dissatisfaction involving relationships. You've cited them as the most probable source of your overall anxiety and depression... Yes, said Tim, smiling. And I did, but it's really the strangest thing because all those problems just kind of solved themselves. Dr. Romero dug into his notes, believing his patient was in classic denial. He decided to press deeper. You'll have to forgive my hesitance. It's just that I'm looking down at this laundry list of concerns you've had over the last few months and... I find it hard to believe that all these issues have simply worked themselves out. The doctor pushed his glasses up on his nose and started itemizing his notes. Your younger son, 
Franklin's behavior problems? Asked the doctor. Dead, replied Tim, remembering his good luck. He jumped off an overpass this morning. Oh, said the doctor. And your older son, Charlie's grades? He hung himself in the teacher's lounge this afternoon. Indeed, said Dr. Romero. And your mother's unrelenting meddling? Tim pointed to the doctor's lobby, enunciating, Sepulchre! Wow, commented Dr. Romero while looking down at the list, reading off the last and most important of Tim's concerns. Your ex-wife? he asked. My ex-wife died of asphyxiation, said Tim, almost triumphantly. Really? asked the doctor. Yep, said Tim. She ran a garden hose from the tailpipe of her car to the inside of her car. Hmm, said Dr. Romero. And do you ever think about killing yourself? No, said Tim. I used to, but not anymore. Well, you might change your mind, and you paid for the hour, so here. The doctor took a length of rope out of his desk. Let me at least show you how to tie a noose. It's much easier than it looks. On the way home, Tim listened to the oldies. The shoulder of the highway was littered with cars, their doors open, bodies lying next to them, baking in the sun. Sweet Home Alabama began to play. Tim sped down the highway with a smile on his face. Then he saw blue lights flashing in his rearview mirror. He'd been going 20 miles over the speed limit. It had just been so easy driving down the empty highway. Tim pulled over and got his paperwork ready for the police officer. In true cop fashion, Tim had to wait 10 minutes before the officer got out of his squad car. The officer walked up and tapped on Tim's window. I pulled you over because you were speeding, said the cop. Tim looked straight into the officer's mirrored sunglasses. He didn't care if he got a ticket. He felt too good. Even if he did get a ticket, the day would still rate among one of the greatest days of his life. You have two choices, said the officer, drawing his sidearm, the setting sun glinting off the barrel of his 9 millimeter Beretta. I can either write you a ticket, or you can blow your head off with this here pistol. Tim didn't even have to pause to think it over. I'll take the ticket, he answered, suddenly understanding why there were so many dead bodies littering the highway. The officer looked dismayed. Sir, do you know how much paperwork I'm going to have to fill out to give you this ticket? Plus, there's a good chance you might even lose your license. Are you sure you wouldn't rather just put a bullet in your brain? It would make both of our lives easier. It's really not a problem for me, officer. I'll take the ticket, said Tim. The officer walked away and Tim waited 20 minutes for a ticket that never came. Before putting his car into drive, Tim walked over to the police cruiser. He looked inside and saw the cop had taken his own advice and put a bullet into his brain. Tim walked back to his car, drove to a hill overlooking the city, and watched the sun make its descent below the horizon. The day was ending. Tim thought it was almost sad, really. But with the last of the sun's rays disappearing into black, Tim realized that it was the really good days, the days like this one, which made life really worth living. Author's Note This story originally started out with a plot of a man who was haunted by terrible visions. After a short time, I came to the conclusion that the terrible visions theme had been driven so far into the ground that it was probably somewhere near the Earth's core when M. Night Shyamalan dug it up to write The Sixth Sense. I also learned that serious horror writing is not my strong suit. I like dark humor, and I'd like to think the humor in this story is somewhat dark. Also, since I mentioned Shyamalan, I'd like to add that I wrote this story more than a year before The Happening was released in theaters. Not that I have anything against Mr. Shyamalan, I'd have no problem admitting he influenced my story if he had, but he didn't. I did think it was pretty cool when all those construction workers were walking off that building, though. All right, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. It was sick. You if know, I it was sick. Do you say so myself? Well, 
Go ahead. Now, I don't know. You know, it was an interesting thing. This guy says he loves dark humor. And that was dark humor. I'll tell you that much, man. It was just uh, amazing to see just how utterly callous this lead character we have is. His, all his family is killing themselves in front of him. And he's just like, hey. I think it was a callous world, though. Yeah. Because everybody right. wanted I mean, that was the, uh, the go-to solution. <laughs> that was the Botox of their world. Right. You know, I, I imagine the story is not to everyone's taste because uh, it is. It, I don't even know how to put it. Uh, R-O-8-O-T? 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 Big, can you ask R-O-8-O-T if he would do me a favor? If he would do you a favor uh -huh. and maybe play uh, an excerpt of our reading of the story. Okay. Hey, O-A-T-O-T. You know that montage we had made up? You can play that? Thanks, man. A sick story. <laughs> sick. This is such a sick story, dude. As sick as it can be. Dude, it was his son. This story is wrong, man. It's wrong on many levels. I'm going to have to bathe. Okay, well, as you can see there, I had a little bit of trouble reading the story all the way through without some kind of commentary. <laughs> I, I had to wonder what, what, what it was about the story. Not that it's poorly written, but oh, yeah, man, well it is bent. It is disturbing, definitely. I wonder if our listeners are as disturbed as us that they appreciate the story the way that we did. I read that story when it came in to our submissions box, and I thought, this story is so sick. It's like the sickest story I think we've had so far. I mean, we've had some, like, utterly gory stories sent in to us where they're like, oh, yeah, so we cut the child's head off and put it on a stick and ran around the room enjoying ourselves, Big. you know. Yeah. That, that was your story. Oh, that's right. Anyway, so we've had some really gory stories like that, and yet they don't quite seem as sick for some reason i think it's the utter cheer and, and and enjoyment that this guy takes all these deaths with makes it so messed up i don't know yeah thank you saul for sending us that story and uh what, what is that old uh chinese curse may you live in interesting <laughs> times that's right if the listener still one right i'm pretty sure yeah. if uh, that listener would like to submit a story how do they get that to us First, take a look at our submission guidelines over on the website, dunesteve.com. No severed baby head stories, because we're full up. <laughs> That's right. I've already done four of them. and Two of the baby heads were named after me. Why, why do you think <laughs> I stopped reading? So anyways, yes, if you do have a good story that you'd like to submit to us, you send it to submissions at dunesteve.com. Right. If you have a comment about this twisted episode of the Dune Steve, you can leave a comment at our blog page right on the episode. You know, I would like to know if the audience found this amusing, if they found it kind of disturbing, unsettling, if they hated the story. Yeah. Um, I mean, not every story is for everyone. That's true. And just the, the fact that you and I happen to both, I guess I got some kind of savage amusement from the story. Yeah. And I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Saul, if you have anything else, uh, send it our way. And we'll, maybe I, I'm just curious to see if all this guy's writing is like that. Okay, uh, another thing that you could do to help us out, aside from leaving a comment, is our volunteer drive, I guess you could call it. This is an open-ended invitation. Even 15, 20 episodes a year from now, we'd probably still be looking for help. So please still feel free to volunteer. We... Still need people to edit stories if you'd like to get in on that production end of the podcast. And we also need people to do voices still. We still have lots of openings for that. Artwork. Oh, yes. Artwork, artwork for the website. If you have a talent in drawing or uh, what do they call it? Photoshop that? or... Yeah, just any of that stuff for the visual side of our website. And also for the... It's not the audio side. For the musical side. Ha ha, I didn't have to say oral. <laughs> Shoot, I just did. For the musical side of our podcast, uh, we'd still like to use music, uh, a main theme, a scary theme for the October Scary Story episodes, uh, for just interstitials, um, chapter breaks. Just uh, music, if you've got something or, or are willing to make something up on a keyboard. Yeah. Or a xylophone. I, I, I Ever since Oingo Boingo, I've always liked the xylophone. You? Uh... You know what? Let's do a whole podcast about the xylophone. Okay. Tune in next week, folks, for the... Xylophone. Even John Smith Dude, tunes my out. Mic is freaking out. Big, I noticed that you're holding the microphone. You are too. 
Yes, yes, I am. So there's obviously the other way that you can help us out. That's right, yes. We do still run on donations. We could really use a donation. You know what? I think we need to do some kind of incentive. Some kind of, an, you know, like when you go to buy a new car and they're like, you have $5,000 cash back. If when we were kids. 20000 uh, I remember one year they were giving Cabbage Patch dolls if you bought a car. I was just like, wow, Mom, does a Cabbage Patch doll cost the same as a car? And she's like, shut up, get in your cage. And then, like, there was one year they were giving away Optimus Primes if you bought a car. And I was like, oh, Mom, can we get a car? And she's like, I told you to get back in your friggin' cage. Right. Yeah. So kind of like that. If we get a donation, if someone donates, I will punch Rish in the stomach on air. What? That, that's if we, get a no, if we get a donation. If somebody presses the button. But why? Why, why, why would you want to punch me? <laughs> Have you ever listened to our podcast? Well, that's why. But, but, but if we don't get a donation, then what? I get to punch you in the stomach? No. If we don't get a donation, well, that already hurts both of us. So there you have it, folks. If we get a donation, Rish gets punched on air. No, no wait, wait. Don't we have some kind of voting system on this that we will vote? Hey. Because I feel like... Get back in your cage. So yeah, this the story that we had today kind of brought up some interesting ideas. We were just wondering where one might draw the line. Where, when has it gone beyond being just something sick and gotten into something that you wouldn't go for? Is there anything, Rish, that you draw the line at that you just wouldn't write about? I'm sure there are things out there. As far as my own writing is concerned, one time um, I surprised myself with a particularly nasty end to a story that I hadn't planned. It was just, it felt right at the time, even though I liked the characters and I didn't feel like they should suffer. And I was kind of ashamed of myself afterward. Well, how about you then? Uh, I remember one time back in college, I was writing a story and my roommate was reading as I went along. And, you know, I was trying to make this guy at the start, he, he had to turn really evil. And in my mind, I thought he's going to follow this child off somewhere and then he's going to, you know, murder this child. And that's how we see just how evil this guy has become. And my roommate was just horrified with this. He's like, oh, you're not going to kill a kid. He basically tried to shame me into changing this bit. And yeah, it wound up being another one of those stories that I never finished. Hmm. How about sense of humor? Uh, remember the lady in Jaws? She's like, oh, I don't think that's funny. I, I didn't think that was funny at all. For some reason, her voice is always in my mind every time. Somebody tells a joke and somebody says, you should be ashamed of yourself. Do you often feel that you have to censor yourself, whether it's here on the podcast or at work or just in conversation, depending on who you're talking to? Not necessarily because of profanity, uh -huh. but just you know what's inappropriate or what's, what's, Orders of what's good going taste. to work. Yeah. You know, I think I have a uh, penchant for humor in the uh, adolescent range, in the scatological range, I could even say. I think fart jokes are funny. I think poop jokes are funny. Vomit puke jokes, things like that kind of make me laugh. I've had my wife try to censor me many times when I say something that's, that she's decided has gone over the line. And when my wife tried to prevent me from doing my duty, I corrected her you know a show that we both like to watch a, a fair amount is uh, robot chicken which is one of those shows that can be really really funny and then other times it just crosses the line I th i'm not sure why it is that every sketch has to end with somebody blowing their brains out or being murdered in some really brutal fashion but i guess that just doesn't strike me as funny myself they just go to that well a little too often i don't know what do you think I don't know why they have to repeat themselves so much on that show. It does get to be pretty predictable. And, you know, it really shouldn't be in a show that's, what, 11 minutes long? <laughs> but I, I think part of their appeal is the bad taste factor. There's shows like South Park or right. Family Guy where they definitely, in, in South Park's case, they look for ways in which to offend people. Right. I find South Park to just be brilliant. But it's usually not the offensive stuff that I love on there. Right. I feel like Trey Parker is brilliant in some ways, and it shows, but, and then other times it's not there. And I, I don't know as much about Seth Green and Matthew 
unpronounceable last name. <laughs> Although I got to say, on Robot Chicken, sometimes you'll tell me about a sketch that you've seen, and it's very, very funny. And then I see the actual sketch, and, and you know what? So not, not so much. Not so much, yeah. I think they have some brilliant moments. I just happened to be watching the show the other day where the dam breaks and floods the Smurf village. And all the Smurfs die and Gargamel goes out and he's fishing the Smurfs out of the stream. And he's like, oh, it's the greatest day of my life. And he chops them all up and he cooks them. Because, you know, apparently I think that's what Gargamel was trying to do all along was catch a Smurf so he can eat it. Because apparently they're really yummy or something. Then again, there's also sometimes when he wants to try and turn them to gold. Do you think we could do a whole episode about the Smurfs? Probably. Not next week because that one's taken, but the week after. Okay. Because you remember Smurfette originally had black hair? Yeah, she, she was originally evil too. I think she yes, was she was created by Gargamel. By Gar- Gargamel. Wasn't she? Interesting, but anyways, yeah, the, Gargamel's the Amanda goals. Bynes version, ladies. And gentlemen. <laughs> Gargamel's goals were a little confused, but anyways, so he finally cuts it all up and he cooks it up and he gets it out and he sits down and he takes a bite and he chews it, and then he stands up and he dumps it all in the trash <laughs> and he calls for Chinese takeout. <laughs> Sometimes brilliant, sometimes not. I mean, the same episode, there was a fair amount of not-so-brilliant stuff. So, I don't know, maybe I got offended. Maybe that was my problem. I don't think so. I just didn't think it was funny. But, uh, yeah, it seems like it's harder to be really funny when you have to go for the offensively funny stuff. I've uh, recently been watching this show called Little Britain. I I guess it's been around for years and years. But over here it hasn't. And uh, I I just barely discovered it in 2008. And I gotta admit, like the first episode I saw, I probably laughed once. And now I find myself quoting the episodes (laughs) and knowing the character names and stuff. And I, I just thought it would be interesting to look up the history of the show. And so I went online and there were all these quotes from from television critics and, and teachers or people of influence when the show first came out, just lambasting it for being so crude and so vulgar and for lowering the median intelligence of everyone in Great Britain and you know, what a disgusting show it was and pandering to the lowest common denominator. I'm sure they were thinking of us. <laughs> they probably had the same kind of thing going on 40 years ago when Monty Python hit the scene as well. Sometimes I see Monty Python shows and I think this would be offensive still now. Amazing that they would get away with that back in 1971. And as far as I know, that was a big hit over here. So I'm just wondering because it seems like television, American television in 71, wouldn't have shown any of that stuff. I think they actually showed it on MTV in the 80s. They did. I recorded. That's when I was first introduced to Monty Python was on MTV. Do you know, uh, box office-wise, what Monty Python's most successful film was? Live at the Hollywood Bowl. I don't know what. Uh, It was Life of Brian. I know a lot of people that are offended by the Life of Brian. Oh, yeah. There's that scene where Jesus makes the blind man be able to see. Was he blind or was he lame? Well, anyway, there's there's either a, a blind man or a lame beggar, and he heals him. And then the beggar realizes that he won't be able to beg anymore. He asks Jesus, you know, if he can just kind of put him back the way he was. And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, there's just no pleasing some people. And I remember thinking that was so dang funny. And then I told somebody else and they were like, hey, that ain't cool, man. Yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, I know that at least in the culture I was raised in, uh, Life of Brian is not well regarded because yeah. of religious sensibilities. Yeah, going into religion is always a hard place to try and be funny because too many people will find things very offensive. It's always best to steer clear with that. And But yeah, you know what? Somebody's always going to be offended. I don't think we've ever put a warning except for on this episode <laughs> because, uh, like we said, the very, very first episode, episode zero, this podcast, We're Adults, And we're assuming everyone who listens is an adult. And if you've got kids that listen to podcasts, I mean, I think it's great that you're sharing the Doonstief with them. But I cursed, what, 90 times on today's episode already? I think so, yeah. Our stance was always, you want to play it for your kids, that's your choice. But definitely you should be the one to decide that. Now, We're not going to rate these and say, this one's rated G for everybody. And, and somebody has to make that arbitrary decision that this one is R. Or, or there's a podcast that you and I listen to. And yeah, they go as far as to say, this episode is rated X. X. And there have been a couple times when I thought, what, really, was that X? Because X is something else in my mind. <laughs> well, so I, I believe that on the iTunes entry for the Doonstief, you have labeled it explicit. Yeah. The only ones that made it in there as clean were our promos. Okay. I, I went ahead and made sure they were clean so people might actually play them. 
<laughs> How's that working out for you? Uh, so good. I'm of the opinion that just because it says explicit doesn't mean that it's bad. Right. The explicit warning labels that they put on CDs back when there were CDs, back when <laughs> I was your boy, I, you know, I think there are lots set. of people that just, they see that as like a great big rated X. And they're just like, you know, I'm not going to listen to anything like that. And, you know, I feel bad for the artists that maybe they have one song with in it. Whoa. And uh, oh, eight oh t can you edit that out, please? Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, with a bad word, like whoa, wait, oh, T, can you take care of that? Okay, just let me get through the sentence. So, so I am sure that there are people that they didn't put out an explicit rap album. They're not two uh, live crew. They didn't put out a two live crew album, but because somebody sees the word whoa, hey, wait, oh, T, you... they they get labeled with that uh, explicit thing. Anyway, I, I guess what I was trying to say is, except for this episode, oh, God. Of, I'm sorry, except for this episode, I, I don't know that we've ever gone out of our way to be vulgar. <laughs> except for this episode, yeah, where we just continue to go out of our way. Certainly, it's better safe than sorry, in my opinion, as far as explicit goes. I don't want to ever have to apologize that, you know, that I said, but talk. I um, leave that one away, OT. I've totally gone off the rails on a crazy train. Yeah. Can you do that thing that he goes in here? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. You, I, I, we, I. Don't, we don't want to sing yet. That's next week's. So. Ah, that's next week's episode. Yeah. I mean, you know what? Everybody's got their own sensibility. And, you know, my mom used to always complain about the cursing. I think I've, I've mentioned that before. And I was like, why, why does there have to be so much swearing? And then I have a friend who, who thinks that words like are perfectly acceptable. And we went and saw an R-rated movie just the other day. And he said, I can't imagine why that would be rated R. And he always says that. He could just record himself saying that. And every time we go see a movie, you push play. And I was like, well, they do say ribose. And I don't think you can say that on a PG-13, man. Or... Not without screaming real loud. <laughs> Oh, hey, all right, OT, can you bleep out us laughing? And, uh, you know, as far as horror stories go, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation of what do you find scary? And, you know, I think that old women are scary. And children. And children, that's right. And cows. As far as horror goes, you know, probably everybody has their own threshold of where, where you go too far. And you remember how Stephen King used to always say that he would try and, what was it? He would try and terrify the audience. And if that didn't work, then he would horrify the audience. Yeah, he would and go for the And if that didn't out. work, he would go for the gross out. Good job. My thunder, can you give it back, please? Oh, sorry. Here you go. Go again. I, I remember people saying that Stephen King was sick or that he was demented or one of those silly words that people kick around. And then I've heard people say, people that read Richard Lehman or, you know, Clive Barker type people say, you know, Stephen King is, is a, is, he's a wet end. He writes for old people kind of thing. Different strokes for different folks. That's what she said, yeah. See, I've never found a that's what she said offensive until now. But I'm sure there are people out there. Uh, how many times would you say we do a that's what she said <laughs> and leave it in the show? Maybe one out of what? Every five or ten? One out of, yeah. The ones that we actually, you, what's the ratio of ones that make it in the show? Oh, yeah, it's probably one out of five. See, in my semi-educated opinion... There are three jokes that are always going to be funny. Uh -huh. One is a spit take. Oh, spit takes are right. always funny to me. Two is uh, that's what she said. And three is plays on the word Uranus. I just, I will <laughs> never, ever get tired of those. Um, and I know that other people probably don't feel that same way. It would be interesting for me, uh, John Smith of... 223 Crescent Circle. Thank you. If you'd share stuff that you find offensive, uh, I mean, well, we could have... I guess gone into places is like, well, hey, I don't go there. We could talk about, like, you know, my uncle has a real problem with, like, any time a kid gets hit in a movie or whatever, you know, slapped or something like that. That's the sort of thing that does not bother me. I love it when, like, a little kid gets kicked or whatever it is on, like, the... It's cool, I think, if you go in, like, a bully beating up some kid or something like that kind of an angle. But an adult beating on a kid is not so cool. Oh, see, because I was just going to say the opposite. 
Oh yeah, you like adults beating on kids? I do. I think it's That's great. Why you do it all I the think time. it should happen more often. But you know, there there's these jokes like uh, in Superman, the seventy eight Superman, where he saves the cat from the tree and he gives it to the little girl. The little girl says, "Mommy, mommy, a man flew up in the tree and he got the kitty down." And she's like, "What have I told you about lying? Slap!" I think that's hilarious, man. Uh, we were talking about horror and what's okay and what's not. There was this show uh, on the Showtime network, which in the U.S. is a pay TV network. You know, you can show or say anything you want. Mm-hmm. You can say d*** if you like. Oh, it t- You know what to do. Thanks. So the man who was making it was going to make an, an anthology horror series for Showtime. And it was going to have gore and it was going to have nudity and all this stuff. But there were two things that the network said, hey, well, you know, you can do whatever you want, but you can't do these two things. And one was, oh, no, I won't do that. Sorry. Oh, so they, they, they played the meatloaf song for him. And they said there are two things that you can't do. You guys can do whatever you want, you know, as much violence as you want and profanity or whatever it might be. But one of the things was there could be no children killing other children. Hmm. You could have adults killing children. And you could have children killing adults, but you could not have child-on-child violence. And I thought that was interesting. You know, I guess it kind of showed the climate at the time. But yeah, it was just it was it seemed a little strange to me. There. Yeah. What was the second thing? Oh, uh, no uh, full frontal robot nudity. And I, what I was going to say is, uh, if somebody would like to comment and talk about, hey, where do you draw the line? And what do you find funny? Or what have you found funny that everybody around you was like, hey, that ain't funny, man. That's exactly what they say. I would just be curious, and maybe we can continue this. The next time we have a story that's sick, it would be fun to talk about movies or, or, or things that we've seen that we thought was hilarious or we, or we were just like, hey, that's too far. It would be fun to hear what they think is funny, what they don't think is funny, what uh, they thought was funny and everybody else didn't think was funny, etc. Well, I guess that's about it, right? Yeah. I think okay. We're wrapping it up. Thank you for listening. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Thank you, announcer man. Uh, Comes all the way out here just so he can say that. Okay, so what do we got? Oh, uh, 08 OT says we have a, a voicemail hate letter. Wow, really? Yeah. Well, that's cool. At least we don't have to read it. There is that. You want to play that, 08 OT? Dear Dune Queefs, I made the mistake of downloading your Highlander 2 of a podcast the other day. I listened to it all the way through because, like Juliana Moore and the Big Lebowski, I am extremely thorough. But I have to say, it was pure torture. But it wasn't the good Gomez and Morticia Adams kind of torture. It was the kind of pointless torture subjected to Han Solo and Princess Leia from The Empire Strikes Back. The kind with no virtue or purpose. Oh, and Chewbacca, too. Uh, the, the only benefits I could see of the Doonstief are twofold. One, to make Joel Schumacher feel better about Batman and Robin and two, to illustrate how lowly and weaker man remake level embarrassing the hosts are. You two are a pair of gigantic geeks, the likes of which haven't been seen since episode 330 of The Simpsons when they go to the silly comic book convention. Listening to you two mouth-breathing dorks makes me worry about the human race, that we're not gonna make it, as they say in Terminator 2. Not that you two will ever breed. I'm sure you score less often than Harry Kim on a double date with Andy Stitzler. You couldn't get laid if you were the only Sailor Moon at a Tokyo cosplay convention. And it makes me sad to even contemplate your lonely, pathetic lives. I'm talking Blade Runner, tears lost in the rain level sad. So, unlike the crew of the Enterprise D in Season 5's Cause and Effect, listening to the Dune Steve podcast is not a mistake I will ever repeat. So say we all. Sean Dragonball's Rothberg, son of Gloin. Wow, Sean, son of Gloin. You've given us a lot to think about. Really put us in our place with that. Yeah, keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Yeah. How did and, you get your home number? Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of freaked out right now. So thank you for listening. That's right, and please tune in again uh, for the next show. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. I'm glad we caught you at home. Could we use your phone? We're both in a bit of a hurry. Right. Good night. Thank you, Vex. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Dude, I was going to dedicate this episode to Ricardo Montalban, but... Uh, is Ricardo Montalban dead? He did pass away, yeah. Mm. I love that man. ¿Quién es más macho? Fernando Lamas o Ricardo Montalban? ¿Quién es más macho? Señor Lamas o Señor Montalban?